you'd think that um, in this day and age that um, green coding would be just common sense. I mean, who doesn't want programs which are not efficient? Or I should say, who wants programs that are efficient? Ones that use less memory, less you know, CPU, that um, are fast. I mean, who doesn't want that? So, and yet here we are. So, um, but looking at it from a different perspective, maybe. So, we're going to look at today what's green coding and the myth versus reality and why it actually matters. So, uh, there's a couple of links here that you can uh, check out. Uh, one is the uh, Green Software Foundation, and the other is an IBM article which is about what is green coding. The uh, link to the Green Software Foundation is um, a group of organizations who are, are building an uh, ecosystem, they're calling it, of people, standards, and tools for the best practices in green software. Uh, so the first thing we need to i guess consider is you know what actually is green coding so when it comes to writing software we're talking about programs that um, use fewer resources and that's in relation to uh, cpu memory and the side effect of that would be less energy being used and if there's less energy being used then the environment the environmental impact is also reduced and the next point here is talking about software that can run well on lower power and older devices. So we don't need to have, you know, let's say the latest hardware in order to run our software on. And so how do we do that? It's by having software which is um, efficient in terms of its resources and also, you know, it's easy to maintain. So we're not having to uh, rewrite everything. So ultimately what we're talking about is, you know, green software is code or software that is built to last and to waste, you know, less. Now, if it is common sense, then uh, maybe, you know, we're talking about stuff that if you did go to a course, you know, be that, at, you know, um, say TAFE, college, university, then everything that is green, we were taught there. I mean, after all, it's talking about things like the big O notation when we're talking about how do we work out whether something is efficient or not. Uh, <clears throat> taught about how, you know, algorithms and data structures and working out how to pick the right ones. Uh, so, well, yes, that is the case. But we're maybe we're just going to change the perspective slightly by saying that if something is performant, that it is, you know, that we pick the right algorithms, then it is also good for the planet. And if um, we're also talking about speed, you know, can be, you know, seen as sustainability. And then also we've got to move up to the points there about, you know, the um, <clears throat> software being, you know, using only the resources that it needs and no more. So then the next question comes about then, well, you know, if that is the case, then isn't it just marketing? Yeah, it can be seen in that way. But the other side of it is that um, if we have software which does things that it doesn't need to do, uh, suppose you've got a, uh, on your phone, you've got tasks running in the background and they can drain the battery. So the by choosing how our software runs and how we write that software can have an impact, you know, on the um, and every decision then which uh, we make when it comes to writing software, you know, can have an effect on the. Uh, so then, why does green code actually matter? Well. Every decision that we make in terms of writing our software will have an effect on the energy that that program uses and therefore the environment. If our program, if we choose um, slower algorithms, uh, then they'll use more CPU. More CPU can be equal to more energy. You know, and similarly for RAM. You don't uh, really want to have a situation where, well, let's just chuck more RAM at the problem. Uh, 
Also then, you know, is, an, is our application uh, disk heavy or not? Heavy access can also have an uh, impact on the life of the battery. And how does our um, device, computer, laptop, phone behave you know, during in idle time? There is uh, nothing worse than, say, having a, uh, a bunch of apps running on your laptop, for instance, and all of them are constantly polling for, is there a new update to grab? Is there a new update to grab? Is there a new update to grab? <coughs> And if you multiply this by, you know, every device, whether that's in your household, the city, your, you know, um, then it all adds up. Especially when, you know, if all of these app, um, if all of these devices are all looking for an application update, as an example. So one of the arguments that gets made is, well, you know, we should be using, you know, a that a compiled language is the um, way to go over, let's say, using an interpreted language. And that is true. You know, a program that's written in free Pascal will perform better than, say, one in Python. And this was uh, demonstrated or shown, um, explained in an article which compared 27 languages um, across 10 different problems to see how they, you know, performed in terms of energy. And in a few, in a minute, we're going to, I'm going to show you, you know, two programs. And all they were doing were calculating primes, and you can see the difference between the two. A developer that can write good, clean, and green code in Python, you can also have a program that can write bad code in Free Pascal or C, or any other language really. Um, <clears throat> But um, generally speaking, though, when you're looking at a language like Free Pascal, then it gets compiled to a native binary. You know, so you can just run it. You don't need any runtime type environment. And a program, though, written in um, Python as a script needs to be interpreted. And all you also need to have then the you know Python runtime type environment present in order for it to run at all. <coughs> so then we're talking about speed, and this is something you will see again that a free Pascal program can be written fast. In fact, you could uh, optimize for size or speed. You've got you know levels of optimization, you know, and if you want to go one step further in terms of actual size of the program while you know it is um you can also strip out you know debugging symbols so the memory then used by something like a free pascal program would be lower than one used in python because you are using like I said the python runtime and the power use then would be efficient in a free pascal program whereas one developed in python might be a bit more costly now this doesn't mean that you know don't use Python. Uh, what I'm actually saying is that you know if you are going, if you do use a language like Python, to use it wisely, and also consider if there are other languages you know that could be used, or that you could dip into when needed, you know, to achieve those um, speed increases or um, energy efficiencies you're looking for. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to switch over to a terminal window here. And as I've said, we've got um, a typical program that will calculate prime. So we'll go into the uh, free Pascal. No, sorry. We're going to go into the Python one first. So basically this is your standard sieve sort of program and what it will do then is to calculate the number of primes for 100 through to 10 million. Yay! Um, and the way it does that basically is, you know, if you look at the top there, it assumes that they're all prime and then for each one that is a prime, it will then go through and rip out all its um, multiples thereof, you know, so that is the uh, name of the game. So we will quit out of here now. And 
what we will do now then is to, we're going to add Python to here. So what we basically be using here is a performance tool um, and we're looking at the stats and looking at the um, power being used. Um, Python. So, <coughs> and let's try that again. What happened? Oh, Python 3, that's why. So here now, um, you can see there was a bit of a gap between 1 million and 10 million. And this particular case here also then, it took, you know, one, over one and a half seconds to run and used, you know, 20, you know, 0.3 joules of energy. <coughs> run it again, you can see the same thing happening. Again, we're talking about, you know, over one and a half seconds to run and about 20 joules of power. So now we're going to run the um, <coughs> same program, but written in free Pascal here. And it's almost instant. Uh, and you can see that we're going from, let's say, 20 joules of power down to 1.45. And also the number of seconds that it took to uh, execute was, you know, much less. And we'll do it one more time just to say that, you know, it wasn't just a fluke. And here we're looking at, you know, 1.63 and 0 0.11, you know, seconds to run. So this program now, <coughs> again, this program here was in, uh, implemented in uh, Free Pascal. Same sort of uh, process you know by just removing out all the um, multiples of each number that is seen as being a prime and you know again we're doing it from you know well in this case here 10 to 1 into 10 to 10 million also note by the way um, <coughs> just in case you you know you can do this in um, a free pascal to do it like a j equals j plus 1 or j equals j plus i i should say <coughs> Now I do also have a um, a C version as well, and just for the sake of uh, completeness, we'll just run it, you know, once or twice. You can see that it has about the same um, amount of power being used as the Free Pascal program, slightly faster. Um, which is to be expected based on the article that C was the the best language, but I wouldn't necessarily use it for you know, creating a desktop type application for that matter. So, um, so you can see here how important that our language choices are. But if you are using something like you know Python, then you can dip into other languages or libraries to you know make your program you know faster or more efficient or so really what this comes down to or what i'm trying to indicate here is that as a developer or a, you know someone who writes software we control the um how our pro we are in charge of how our program performs how much memory it uses does it need any external dependencies you know how much do i need to download in order for it to run uh, can i run my program on an older machine or not um, how long will it actually work for uh, will it do what I want it to do and no more than that? And through this series then, what we're going to be looking at is um, how can we, uh, we're going to you know, highlight how Pascal can be used to write um, software that is, you know, that, is also, that is just as efficient or energy efficient as a language you know, such as C. Maybe not you know, right up there, but you know, close to. Um, tools and habits, you know, for writing sustainable software. Looking at, you know, energy efficient algorithms, um, and you know, then other tools which we can use to measure, you know, how much energy our program uses. And this will also include things like uh, tips and tricks for, and then include things like whether or not we use the static libraries or dynamic libraries and so on. So I hope you will stay with me for this journey. 
Uh, we're going to be, like I said, looking at many things. And until next time in the next video, happy coding, and I'll see you then. Bye.